people will start saying is magical or mystical, simply because different dimension of perception is opened up. If you activate the energy system to its fullest possibility, transmission is natural. If you have eighty-four, you have crossed many, many limits which normally people think are superhuman. Namaskar, Sadhguru. So uh, I wanted to know, um, how does a guru transfer the yogic knowledge or information by means of transmission? The mechanics of it? The mm -hmm. mechanics of that? How, how is it done? Like a cordless microphone, you know. See, without being wired, you are able to transmit. You are quite capable. It's happening, isn't it? So how? See, of the one hundred and fourteen chakras that are there in the body. A chakra literally means a wheel, but what we are referring to is the junction points of the nadis or the energy pathways in the body. These pathways always meet in the form of a triangle. A wheel means a circle. Definitely triangular, triangular wheels are more jazzy, isn't it? Would it look better? They always meet in the form of triangles, but we call them a chakra because when we see in somebody, we see it more as a circle because it's radiating a certain dimension of energy. Because it's radiating, all radiation always happens in circular form. You may throw a triangular stone into a lake, still the ripples are circular, isn't it? Just like that, this may be a triangle, but when we see it, it is circular. And another thing is, it suggests movement from one dimension to another. We say it's a chakra because it takes you across. So there are one hundred and fourteen chakras in the system, major chakras, there are more. Major chakras which can be worked upon are one hundred and fourteen. Out of this one hundred and fourteen, two are outside the physical body, one hundred and twelve are within the body. Out of this one hundred and twelve, four, there is nothing much to do, up, do about them. That is, if you work the other things, these things will happen by themselves. They don't need any system to be worked upon. So one hundred and eight are the things that can be actually worked upon. So there are one hundred and fourteen systems of meditativeness. Adiyogi taught hundred and twelve different ways to realize. So, when he sat down with the seven sages, the Saptarishis, he was expounding as to how the human mechanism functions. And there are one hundred fourteen out of these one hundred twelve. So he spoke about one hundred twelve ways of attaining one's ultimate nature. Parvati, his wife, who was a witness to this teaching, she's already attained, but now she's a witness. She's just hanging around in the program. So she was looking at it and she said, why not more? Why only one hundred and twelve? There should be more ways. Shiva was completely focused in what he was doing. When she said this, he just dismissed her. He said, there are no other ways, there are only one hundred and twelve. She felt stung that in front of these seven people, he dismissed her like that. So, she said, there must be more ways, maybe you don't know. <laughs> he said, there are only one hundred and twelve, this impertinence. He said, leave. So she said, I will find more ways and she went. She withdrew into the mountains and did very severe austerities. And she, after many years of work, she came. Shiva was still expounding various dimensions of yoga. She came, being his wife, she could, after such a long absence, she could come and sit next to him. But she came and sat down one step below to indicate that she has failed. So that's a language between the two of them. She doesn't want the seven people to know that she failed, but she wants him to know that she has failed. 
So she came and sat one step below. So this story continues into various other aspects as to how she involved herself and uh, she is being used as somebody who brings doubt. He is going with such absolute power, these seven people are overawed. So she is brought in as an uncommitted observer who comes up with doubts here and there. Because somewhere, tomorrow when it is thought, not everybody may be as committed and as focused and as receptive as the seven people were, naturally they will come up with these doubts. So she came up with these doubts which normally people would come up with. So these one hundred and eight are the things that you can work with. The remaining four just flower for you, this bonus. If you work well with hundred and eight, the other four will happen. It's a rewarding place. The other two will anyway happen. If these one hundred and twelve have happened, the other two will anyway blossom by themselves. They are not within the physical structure of the body. So these hundred and eight, this hundred and eight is a number that is manifested in this system because of hundred and eight being a significant process or a significant number in the making of the solar system. So the diameter of the sun and the distance between the planet and the sun is hundred and eight times over. The diameter of the moon and the distance is hundred and eight times. Many ways you will see hundred and eight being a proportion in the making of the solar system. That is the reason why, otherwise maybe we would have had hundred and sixty. If suppose we were born in Mars, maybe we would have one sixty or whatever. You must check the men and see. The important thing about Hatha Yoga is to constantly acknowledge that this body has taken shape like this, this body has become this kind of manifestation mainly because the way the potter's wheel is, because of the solar system, the way it is, that is why this manifestation. So Adi Yogi very clearly said, if this human body has to evolve further, some dramatic or drastic changes need to happen in the structure of the solar system. Only then the structure of the human body will change because it's reached its fullest development in terms of physical structure. Now, one can transmit effortlessly if all of this has opened up, if all the hundred and twelve are on, transmission is effortless. You want something to happen there, you don't have to go there, you can sit here and make it happen. To live a normal life, to live a full-fledged physical life, you need only twenty-one chakras. Twenty-one chakras in your body are reasonably operating, nobody will think anything wrong with you. You will be full-fledged human being. What are the remaining things about? The remaining things, if they open up, it opens up various levels of perception. It opens up dimensions of perception that suddenly people are say… people will start saying is magical or mystical, simply because different dimension of perception is opened up. So only twenty-one are needed to live a full-fledged life. The remaining are only about higher dimensions of perception, that you are no more human. In other people's understanding at least, you were very much human, this is human system, because most human beings do not, the majority does not flower. See right now, the coconut trees in Tamil Nadu, I think uh, <laughs> our trees are yielding some ninety nuts per year, per tree. A better managed farm in Tamil Nadu would yield hundred and twenty, hundred and twenty-five. The same coconut tree in Kerala yields forty-five nuts to fifty nuts. The same coconut tree in Karnataka and West Bengal yields two hundred and forty to two hundred and fifty nuts. It's the farming which is different. 
Tamil farmers, they're trying to grow coconut trees in black cotton soil, thinking it's the most fertile soil. Black cotton soil is very fertile for paddy cultivation, cotton and other things, not good for coconut. Coconut needs to be grown where it is slightly little bit of rubble in the soil. Here if you dig, it is like toothpaste, the soil. Now when you irrigate this land, it's very nice. Immediately coconut tree senses life and puts out its fresh roots. When it dries, the contraction is so big in the black cotton soil, you will see it all cracked up like this. So it will squeeze all the roots, all the tips of the roots will be crushed and it cannot grow. Every time it puts out, when it dries, it gets hurt. Every time it puts out, when it dries, it gets hurt. It needs little bit of rocky soil. You can try this. You put one little small piece of stone inside, two feet inside the earth, water it. After fifteen days you open, everything else will be dry. Just beneath the rock, there will be little bit of dampness. So always coconut tree goes and puts its tips of its roots beneath the stones because it knows always it is wet, always that will be damp and it will be protected, it will not be crushed. The same thing with a human being. A human being will not flower to his full potential unless you create an appropriate atmosphere for him, internal and external, but largely fortunately internal because we are mobile, we are not like trees, we cannot stand in one place and have the same atmosphere all the time. But there are people who do this. In India, this culture is there, this is called as Kshetra Sanyasa. Kshetra Sanyasa means we will fix a radius. Let's say here we'll fix a radius from the Dhyana Linga. We will say this much is highly energetic. So those who want to just soak in that all the time, they will take a vow that they will never leave this diameter. This radius, they will not leave and go, they will always be in that only. This is a simple intelligence, like a coconut tree, if it decides to trek up the mountain. It does very reasonably well here, but if you put him up the mountain, in one day he will be down. The wind, have you gone up the mountain? No. If you go to the seventh hill, almost any season, wind will be at least like fifty to sixty kilometers. In the windy season, it'll touch one hundred and twenty to one hundred and forty kilometers per hour. If you stand like this, it'll just throw you out. It's that strong. So if this guy goes and stands there, he won't stand for an hour. So, he better stay here. But the trees are stationary. We are mobile. For us to maintain an external atmosphere, which is always conducive, is difficult. So some people take this step which is called a Kshetra Sanyasa, they will not move out of that space. They fix a radius and just within that. So because you want to soak in that external atmosphere, but the internal atmosphere is the most important thing for a human being as to how he keeps his interiority. That he builds a… this is called a kavacha, that you build a cocoon around yourself, a protective cocoon wherever you go you are in the same atmosphere as far as you are concerned. It's like you get into an airplane, it goes up thirty-five thousand feet, definitely your body wouldn't last there, but now you're in a cocoon, a pressurized chamber. Because of that, you manage. The same thing with the submarine, you wouldn't manage that pressure in the sea, but because you protected, you manage. So like this, you create a cocoon of energy around yourself. Wherever you go, you are not a part of it, you are in your own cubicle that you're walking with. You carry your own cubicle, you don't get into anybody's space, you carry your own little space wherever you go. Otherwise, you restrict yourself. But the important thing is that all the chakras are on means you can simply transmit anything that you wish. The problem is always of receptivity. In the past I've been saying this, I have initiated more people into meditativeness, those that I have never met and seen, than people that I sit with and conduct programs with. We've conducted programs at the most for a few million people, but we've initiated many, many more people. 
They are meditative, but many fools do not know they can meditate. When they sit, not for meditation, they don't even know that they must meditate. If they sit somewhere, their experience of everything is way better than others, but many of them still don't have the brain to understand that they are naturally becoming meditative without any effort. Somehow, and they sit down, others don't sit down, but their experience of life is way better because they are meditative in nature, because they have been initiated directly. So we can transmit this to anybody. Receptivity is the problem. To generate receptivity, there is a lot of work to do. So, you can sit here and uh, let's say you run a radio station, you can transmit in the air very easily. But if nobody has a radio, what is the use? Let's say you started transmitting a, from a radio station before Marconi came and nobody has a radio but you're transmitting and transmitting, what does it matter? Nothing happens, isn't it? So, that is always there. There is some impact of the transmission on people, even if there is no receptivity, but it is not… it does not translate into other dimensions because there is no receptivity. It is easier to transmit to rocks than to human beings. I am not trying to praise rocks and insult you. But uh, it's easier to transmit to rocks because certain type of rocks have the necessary physical integrity but they don't have a brain, they don't think themselves out of things. See, the problem with human being is largely he has thought himself out of many natural capabilities that he already had. Aren't people thinking themselves out of their joy, <laughs> haven't they? how they were th when they were children, haven't they thinking themselves out of their joy and love and natural things that they had? So human beings are thinking themselves out. Because of that, whatever you give them, they can think themselves out. Today you teach them something, well, you have seen many of you, they come to Bhava Spandana and we blow them out. It's really a hit. Oof, everybody is hit and fantastic and dripping with ecstasy, but after six months they will think themselves out of it. So, not everybody knows how to use their thought in a constructive manner. Largely they are thinking about… thinking themselves out of their well-being. They were quite well when they were children, they thought themselves out. So thought is not working always for human benefit. Most people do not know how to use it for their well-being. Largely people are using it to work against themselves. If you activate the energy system to its fullest possibility, transmission is natural. You don't even have to go all the way. If you… if you activate sixty-three, you can transmit quite powerfully. That is the symbolism of the Tamil… Tamil culture is based on sixty-three nine mars they call them sixty-three sages who came, who transformed Tamil culture in a big way. They brought spirituality to everybody's life. This is… one thing is those sixty-three people, maybe there were more people but for the sake of symbolism, they left those people and mentioned only sixty-three. Any temple you go, you will see small, small images of sixty-three images. Because if you have sixty-three chakras going, we can say you are a sage, beginning to be, early sage. If you have eighty-four, you have crossed many, many limits which normally people think are superhuman. If you reach one not eight, that means you are completely there. One hundred and fourteen or fully on means you and him will be same, no difference. If you become receptive, I don't have to come… I come here and explain things to you, somebody need not teach you how to bend, what to do, nothing. You will know everything about human mechanism, everything, from its origin to its ultimate.